Um, we are indeed starting this new series, and there is lots going on um, here at the church and beyond, and want you to make sure that uh, you take advantage of these different things that are going on that really just point to life here at uh, Ferndale and beyond. Um, before I jump too far into this sermon series, I just want to take a moment and just pray um, before we go um, too much further. I want to remind you that look in the rack in front of you, there'll be some cards. You might want to take some notes. There'll be some things that I share today that I hope really um, encourage you and challenge you as well. Um, things you might want to take a look at this week, maybe just pray about as well. Um, it would be, uh, uh, it'll be really beneficial to you uh, to do that and beneficial to us as a church for you to do that this week. But let's pray before, before we start uh, this, uh, this sermon series this morning. And so, God, we uh, are aware of the fact that, um, God, indeed, as we sang this morning, your grace is more than enough. And God, it's not just your grace for us, for those of us who are sitting in this room. God, your grace is for uh, the entire human race. And Lord, we are supposed to be dispensers of the grace that you've given to us. Lord, that grace is to be shared. It's to be spread far and wide. Lord, and that's what we're going to talk about. That's what we've been called to do, to be your people that, Lord, just love uh, recklessly uh, like Jesus did. And Lord, that reckless love, it has a price. Lord, Jesus' reckless love had a price. Uh, and he paid it. But not only, Lord, did he pay that price, but Lord, the price that Jesus paid, Lord, it opened the gates to heaven for all of us. May we, too, be ready and willing to walk through that gate because Jesus opened that gate. He tells us, Lord, he's the... He's the good shepherd. He's the, the gatekeeper who opens us into wide fields of pasture. May we, in turn, be willing to show other people to that same pasture. We love you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Uh, there are two students, um, Larry Page and Sergey and Sir Brin. And um, they sat in their dorm room at Stanford University, and they pledged themselves to the following mission statement. Quote, to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. The result was Google, the most powerful and widely used search engine in the world. And today it seems that uh, kind of this thing that a lot of companies do, large and small, as they adopt mission statements. Even businesses that are unambiguous, they're widely known, their purpose is clear, you could just, I can say their name. Places like FedEx, um, other places like Barnes & Noble, Nike, they all have mission statements. Nike, for example. Nike's is to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. Actually, this idea of having a mission statement, it's even found its way into our government. For example, the State Department of the United States now has a mission statement. Theirs is to create a more secure, democratic, and prosperous world for the benefit of the American people and the international community. It's all about why we do what we do. In this series that we're going to be in this the dandelion effect. It comes from months of intentional, hard, creative work to clarify what we believe God has called us to here at FM, FFMC. What is it that God would have us become as a church in, in this moment? And over the next number of Sundays, we're going to take some time to consider our mission, the vision that God has for us, the things that we we value as a church and what we expect to actually look like in the coming months. And today we want to begin not simply with some whatever we want to do mission that we just kind of sat around and dreamed up. No, we have to begin talking about our mission in light of what Jesus claimed about his own mission on earth. And here's what I want us to take away and to be clear as crystal about today. 
as we think about this. Because of Jesus' mission, we here at Ferndale, we're called to fulfill the mission of this, engaging our communities by sharing God's transforming love, engaging our communities by sharing God's transforming love. So let's begin there, okay? But first, let's talk a little bit about Jesus and his mission and coming to earth. As you can imagine, it might be difficult to narrow down what was Jesus' mission, his ultimate goal and purpose in coming to earth. But I really think that a compelling case can be made that Jesus' mission has been expressed in a song that we probably, many of us, sung in Sunday school. Some of you might know it. It goes like this. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Little man was he. He climbed in a sycamore tree for the Lord he to see. And as the Savior passed him by, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you, how come y'all ain't singing? Zacchaeus, you come down from there, for I'm, for I'm coming to your house. Yeah, I think, I think Jesus is exceptionally clear. This, that little song comes from Luke chapter 19 in the New Testament, if you're wondering. In this encounter with Zacchaeus, this is why Jesus came. The Son of Man which is the title that Jesus used for himself. He came to seek and to save the lost. That was Jesus' mission. And because this was Jesus' mission, here is how we here at Ferndale will live on mission. We will begin by engaging, which means we will go. It comes to us, actually, that idea of going comes to us from Matthew's Gospel, the 28th chapter and the 19th verse, where Jesus says, therefore, go. That's where we start. We just go. Folks, we're being invited to discover new ways and opportunities here at Ferndale to go, to reach those who are lost. We have to find new ways to teach those who are lost. We have to find new ways to love those who are lost. That soccer field out there, did you notice today? You know the soccer field's full? You know the parking lot's full? Let me tell you something about that soccer field, that parking lot. You need to know this. That's full as a result of two things, two people, both connected with Ferndale. Did you know that? That field is full today because of two people from right here. Our own uh, partner in ministry, Pastor Alan Muniz, uh, he leads Nueva Vida, and they've been meeting here on Sunday evenings. He organized that tournament. But it's also been done in partnership with our own uh, sister, Ara de la Mora, who leads a Hispanic uh, community center type ministry. She did that last year. She told me, I talked with her this morning. She told me that she organized this event last year. They had to cancel it because no one would register. Did you notice the field today? She partnered with Pastor Allen. And that field's gonna be full today. Started at eight o'clock this morning through 2.30, three o'clock this afternoon. They're going. They're showing us how you go, how you engage. That's what it's all about. And there's no exception to that. There's no exception to going. I wanna be really clear. We're not adding new guidelines or a different guidelines regarding who can come to know Jesus. Our task simply is to go. We wanna engage those where we live. We want to engage with those where we work. We want to engage with those where we learn. We want to engage with others where we play. And here's a critical truth. When this thing called the church originally began, compassion and kindness caused this group of people to stand out. Rodney Stark is a sociologist of religion, and he estimates that the church grew at a rate of 40% per decade during its first several decades. Now, 
I tried to do the math on this, and I'm not real good at math, but I kind of figured this one out. This means that for the first several years of his existence, the church around the world was doubling in size every eight to 12 weeks. So every three or four months, it would double. Another three or more, it would double. And that continued for several decades. That's a crazy rate of growth. Here's what Pastor Rick Rousseau, he says about this. He says, the early Christians didn't have direct mail, which I hate anyway. They didn't have direct mail, large special events. They didn't have banners to get their message across. All they had was themselves. The church that developed long-term trusting relationships with the community is the one that has an opportunity to influence its culture. When we talk about engaging our communities, that's what we mean. This is our mission. Mission is not a burden that's laid upon the church. It's a gift, and it's a promise to the church that it's faithful. The command arises from the gift. Jesus reigns, and all authority has been given to him on earth and in heaven. When we understand that, we shall not need to be told to let it be known. Rather, we shall not be able to keep silent, engaging. So that's what we're continuing to think about when it comes to Jesus' mission, when it comes to being on mission here at Ferndale. We will engage, but what will we engage? We'll engage our communities. This whole idea of making disciples of all nations, of all people. In Matthew chapter 28, we're going to pick that up again. Matthew chapter 28, reading a little bit more from uh, verse 19, we read, we're supposed to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. There's a guy by the name of uh, Erwin McManus, and he wrote a book called An Unstoppable Force, Daring to Become the Church that God Has in Mind. And he said this in the book that is in the spirit of what we read about from Matthew's gospel. He says this, he said, a movement begins defying tradition, strangely sacred, yet sacrilegious, without title or privilege, revolutionary, out of obscurity into history. A movement begins against all odds, uniting reverence with relevance, unstoppable, questioning everything and answering only to God. I would continue this aspect of our mission in engaging our communities. It'll show up, it'll manifest in our context in at least two ways. This is how it shows up here. First, we need to look for folks who are living on the margins. We must become a community for those who have no community. And that's really hard work. It's incredibly demanding. But if you read the Old and New Testament, it becomes crystal clear that God's heart is for those who are broken, those who are frequently left without a voice. Did you know there are over 400 biblical passages that explain God's heart for the orphan, for the widow, for the homeless, for the poor, for the hungry, for the sick, for the differently abled, for the alien, or as we might say in the 21st century, for the immigrant. I read this years ago, and I still believe it to be true and to be part of what we his church, are to be about. God is attracted to weakness. He can't resist those who humbly and honestly admit how desperately they need him. So, but secondly, there's a second thing. Engaging our communities, it'll mean that we look for ways to bless the community. And in the coming weeks, you'll hear more about what it looks like to bless our communities. So kind of sit tight to hear more about that. But I want to be really honest with you in this moment as I share in this. It's really exciting stuff to me. <clears throat> Much of the chatter that we hear about in our local communities, our cities, our towns, and neighborhoods, friends, it's pretty negative. It can get pretty negative. Or it focuses on taking back the community, as if we're in some sort of arm wrestling match or a war for the places 
that we call home. I find it amazing. I find it amazing that God calls his people to engage in a specific spiritual discipline for the expressed purpose of seeing the places we live in flourish and thrive. Did you know that? God has a very specific thing you and I are supposed to do. Listen to what God tells his people there to do when it comes to this whole idea of engaging their communities. It comes from Jeremiah chapter 29. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Let me stop real quick. God has punished the nation of Israel for their disobedience. And he has let them be captured as spoils of war, literally. Take it out of their own land. And this is what he says to those people who've been captured because they were disobedient. This is what he says. Build houses, settle down, plant gardens, and eat what they produce. Build houses, marry, and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, what's he say? You too will prosper. Here's a fact. It's incredibly difficult to make disciples in a place or a community when your opinion of that community is a negative opinion. I want to repeat that. It is incredibly difficult to make disciples or engage a community when you have a negative opinion about that community and or the people who live in that community. And yet, in fulfilling the mission of Jesus, it is so easy to forget that in fulfilling that mission, we have to love the communities we're placed in. Even when it's difficult to do so, even when it seems impossible to do so, if we're to teach others about who Jesus is, about the love of God, the truth of his word, we may have to go all the way back to the beginning on this and relearn how to love the places, the spaces, the community God has placed us in. Interestingly enough, I think it's far too easy to kind of let that, that thing happen, this habit where we forget what we're made for, what we're called to be, to do. Consider the mission statement of a well-known university. Listen to this. Their mission statement is this, to be plainly instructed and consider well that the main end of your life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ. This was, place was founded in 1636. This university employed exclusively Christian professors. It emphasized character formation and its students above all else and placed a strong emphasis on equipping ministers to share the good news. Every diploma read Veritas Christo et Ecclesi, meaning truth for Christ and his church. You've probably heard of this school. It's called Harvard University. Only 80 years after its founding, however, a group of New England pastors, they, they sensed that Harvard had drifted too far from their liking, and they were concerned that the secularization at Harvard was so much they approached a, a wealthy philanthropist who shared that concern. His name was Elihu Yale, and he financed their efforts in 1718, they called the college Yale University. Yale's motto was not just veritas, truth, like Harvard, but lux et veritas, light and truth. Today, Harvard and Yale's legacy of academic excellence is intact, but neither school resembles what their founders envisioned. At their 350th anniversary, Harvard, the, the, the former president uh, they had a former president of John Hopkins speak. His name was Stephen Miller, and he bluntly stated, he said, the bad news is the university has become godless. Larry Summers, who was the former president of Harvard itself, he confessed, things divine have been central, neither to my professional nor my personal life. Harvard and Yale's founders 
were unmistakably clear in their goals. Academic excellence, Christian formation. Today, they do something very different from their founding purpose. What happened to Harvard and Yale? That's, that's called mission drift. Have you ever heard that phrase, mission drift? Yeah. But I want to continue to think about Jesus' mission. Jesus' mission, his idea of this living on mission, what that looks like here at Ferndale. It means engaging, right? Engaging means we must go. Engaging our communities means we have to make disciples of all people. But we're engaging our communities with God's transforming love. We're, we're teaching them to obey my commands. Love God. Love one another. And we finish this passage from Matthew where we uh, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. Exactly what is this what is this transforming love? This love that changes people at kind of the most profound, profound level. I think you can get a hint of it from an encounter that Jesus had. It comes to us in this way. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked them, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. What is this transformational love we're talking about? Love that's demonstrated, frankly, by loving God, loving others. Um, when I was uh, first starting a ministry, there was a, a Christian counselor by the name of Larry Crabb. I don't know if you know that name, but I loved reading Larry Crabb's books, just to kind of help me help others as they thought through what it meant to live the Christian life. And, and Larry Crabb wrote about this transforming love in a book that's just an incredible book. And I think it beautifully describes the mission of Jesus and what he sought to accomplish. Larry Crabb wrote this. He said, at its core, the church is a spiritual community journeying together toward God. It's where people reach deep places in each other's hearts that are not often easily reached. They discover places beneath the awkwardness of wanting to embrace and cry and share opinions. They openly express love and reveal fear, even though they feel so unaccustomed to that level of intimacy. The longing to know God becomes tense, becomes stronger than all other passions worth whatever price must be paid for it. And practically speaking, just real practically speaking, what might that look like, to, to that transforming love? There was a man, he had no interest in spiritual matters. But he related pretty casually to the Christian who lived next door to him. How they talked over the back fence and borrowed lawn mowers and stuff like that. The non-Christian's wife was stricken with cancer, and she died three months later. Here's part of a letter that he wrote afterwards. The man said, I was in total despair. I went through the funeral preparations and the service like I was in a trance. After the service, I went to the path along the river. I walked all night, but I didn't walk alone. My neighbor, afraid for me, I guess, stayed with me all night. He didn't speak. He didn't even walk beside me. He, he just followed me. When the sun finally came up over the river, he came over and said, Let, let's go get some breakfast. I go to church now, my neighbor's church, a religion that can produce that kind of caring and love. My neighbor showed me, that's something I want to find out more about. I want to love and be loved like that for the rest of my life. Kind of amazing when you think about it. God's transforming love. And Jesus modeled, he lived it out. God's transforming love. 
which is what we're called to demonstrate here at FFMC. It's often just as simple as that story I just, I just shared with you. True story. Loving God, loving people. That was Jesus' mission. And so it has to be ours too. The Church in the Canyon. Has anybody ever heard the Church in the Canyon? Church in the Canyon was engaged in kind of their typical Sunday morning activity when its normal routine was shattered by the sound of a helicopter crashing into a hillside across the street. Pastor Bob Birkus, sensing that the crash was fatal, immediately led his small congregation toward the parking lot for a moment of impromptu prayer. The Presbyterian pastor expected to see first responders descend on the area. What he didn't expect was a steady influx of news reporters, camera crews, fans from all walks of life. They were coming to remember the lives of those who'd perished in that crash. Retired basketball star Kobe Bryant and his daughter Gianna, a budding basketball player, baseball coach John Altobelli, his wife Carrie and Alyssa, their basketball-playing daughter, Sarah Chester and her daughter Peyton, basketball coach Christina Mauser, and helicopter pilot Ara Zabayan. Pastor Biricus and the church were unprepared for the number of visitors, but they quickly found ways to be hospitable. According to the Washington Post, Ben Golliver, the church offered coffee, water, and fruit as refreshments, provided outlets and power strips so folks could charge their smartphones. They welcomed grieving visitors into impromptu prayer services. The Bible says we're supposed to practice hospitality, said Birkus. That's what we did. We prayed with people who were emotionally overwhelmed, in tears, and in open grief. Sometimes all people need is a hug, a God bless you, a, sh a short prayer, a cup of water. I've always believed more good is done in this life when you can get close to the ground and share life with the people around you. It's a true account of a church seeking to simply fulfill their calling in the moment. It offers you, it offers me an incredibly powerful insight on what it means for us to fulfill our own mission in our own context right here. Because of Jesus' mission, we here at Ferndale are called to fulfill the mission of engaging our communities by sharing God's transforming love. Would you pray with me? God, it seems such a simple thing to do. And Lord, immediately our mind might leap to all the things <laughs> that we could do. And God, instead, may we take this time to get really still before you. And Father, allow you to... Tap our hearts to fill our hearts with love for wherever we may live, our neighborhoods, our jobs, our schools, wherever we may play, or that we would be bearers, that we would be those who share your transforming love. It will require much of us. It will require all of us. It did for Jesus. May we rest in the knowledge that because Jesus has done this, so can we, so must we. We pray this all in your son's name. Amen.